Hello. Hello and welcome to Answer Time, <laughs> about which I'm very excited. And I'm glad that you are too, showing up when there's so many other competing offers and opportunities available all around this fabulous, fabulous show. It is brilliant, isn't it? I mean, let's just, just give big, big kudos to the brilliant Cherry family who put on this fabulous event for us all. I am ridiculously overexcited about it. Well done, the Cherries. Yay. I mean, it is a bit presumptuous, isn't it, putting on a panel called Answer Time, as if somehow we have all the answers. And, and of course, we don't. This is a really, really rich time of learning for us in farming and environment action. And we do need to be learning fast because the pressure is great. Time is short. We need to be able to move fast. And perhaps that's why we've positioned the panel in the way that we have, because there are some things that we do know. I don't know about you, but very often I get um, challenged by some folk when I'm doing my work. And they say, oh, but are we sure that if we make these changes, we'll still be able to feed the world? Are we sure that if we do this thing over here, it's not going to exacerbate a cost of living crisis? That's the latest. So we get lots of pushbacks, I think, about the research, the evidence, the material on which we as a community are relying and indeed building and growing ourselves. So the purpose of this panel today is to bank with a brilliant group of people those things that we think we do know. Where are we confident, or at least confident enough, about the evidence that we're working with, the research that we're working with, the practice and the experience that is hard won over many decades of our work? And therefore, what do we need to be researching, working on, experimenting with next? so that we focus our time and our effort and our energy in the right places and not wasting time going over and over and over again those things that we know are strong enough in terms of making the case for change. So that's what this is about. And I have got an absolutely stellar panel. I, I just, I mean, this is, this is the real reason that we love Groundswell, isn't it? Because we just meet the people that we don't see enough of year in, year out. And so I'm really, really excited to have this brilliant panel with me. We've got Russ Charrington on the end there. And people are going to introduce themselves in a minute, so I'm just going to name them. We've got Russ, we've got Lindsay, we've got Janet, we've got Jen, and we've got Janet. You might have to be Janet number two. Should we? Janet H. <laughs> Janet H, who's joined our panel. <laughs> yes, the other, oh, yes. <laughs> who's joined our panel and who's in the thick, of course, of the policy um, responses to this, the questions that we're talking about. So let's, let's, let's let people introduce themselves. Russ, I'm going to start with you. Hello, thank you. Um, so yeah, Russ Carrington, and just a brief summary um, and, and why I'm perhaps here and why it's relevant is that I grew up on a family farm, but I left the farm to go studying engineering because there wasn't a viable future for me on the family farm. Uh, working as an engineer, I saw around the world lots of things going on that didn't look particularly positive in terms of the environment and I, and I essentially brought that thinking back into farming, got involved in setting up the um, Pasture Fed Livestock Association, now called Pasture for Life, and then I spent the, most of the last two years setting up a regenerative farm at the Nepa State, which is, is well known for its rewilding, but I set up a regenerative farm next to the rewilding to show how different types of farming systems and land management systems could work alongside one another to uh, be of benefit to the whole landscape. And all the time, I've been really trying to champion and understand uh, pasture-based livestock systems. So mostly grazing herbivores, uh, cattle, sheep, and, uh, and more recently, and this morning, was chairing a session on pasture poultry, how we can fit poultry into our pasture systems as well. And I've really been trying to work with farmers to champion those livestock systems as solutions to many of the problems we're facing. Not the only solution, but part of the solution to addressing uh, many of the environmental issues that we're facing, health issues, and, and trying to pioneer and find out what are the better ways of doing this. And 
for me, all the all of the answers are there. And so the question I'm I'm sort of often having and, and sometimes think I have the answer to is how do we make change happen? How do we get farmers through a transition? And I think there's actually a lot of psychology involved in that. So I'm really trying to understand more about human psychology and what it takes to, to help change happen. Now I've finished at the Nepa State and I'm, I'm sort of farmer mentoring, coaching um, uh, for a few farmers, uh, including a really interesting farm out in Romania. And the, the, the environment in Romania, as some of you will know, is really under threat. It's really sad to see because there are so, some of the most amazing wildflower meadows, and yet the plough and the monocultures of wheat are coming down the valley. Um, and so what is it we have to do to unlock the potential of, of mixed farming done in a grass-fed way, in a well-balanced way, by good practitioners? And that's, that's kind of where I'm at and what I'm doing, what I'm trying to deliver on the ground, making change happen here and now. Thanks. Thanks, Ross. Lindsay. Yeah, hi all. I'm Lindsay. I started out in farming. Uh, my first job was milking dairy cows, and I stayed in farming for a few years before um, retraining as an animal scientist. And I now work as a livestock researcher at the Organic Research Centre. The things that interest me about animals in farming are their dual role within farming. So animals within the food system and animals within nature. They're fundamental existence as an ecological being in their own right. Uh, a further thing that interests me is human-animal relationships. And the last thing that really interests me is how we develop farming systems that give these animals a life that is worth living. So those are my three main focus areas. I think in, well, we've long known that our global food systems are both wasteful and environmentally degrading. But we've now seen in more recent times with COVID, with political changes, both the rise of nationalism here and abroad, um, with war, with climate change, just how much fragility there is in that food system. But it's perhaps not really surprising when we think of all the relationships along the food chain from the landscape to the customer is based on fragility and the breaking, indeed, of these relationships. <laughs> if I focus on the components that are related to the animals, we can start with the human-animal relationship and the animal-human relationship, where ever-increasing numbers are kept in ever-confined systems, with fewer animals, uh, sorry, fewer humans, and fewer hours per animal within these systems. We've got automation. It's not a bad thing in itself, but it's replacing that relationship rather than enriching it. And then we think about the human-human relationship because happy humans make for better livestock experiences, better welfare for them. We've got farming. It's less attractive for people to work in farming, so finding the human resources within a farming system is increasingly difficult. Making the farm itself um, not a good place to be. Isolation is also a factor in this. Then we've got the animal-animal relationships. We've got disruption, we've got high numbers of animals kept in the same place where meaningful social relationships can't be kept or maintained. Alongside this, we've got the animal's relationship with its own environment, where there are very few valid choices for these animals, both in terms of feed and in terms of comfort uh, and body maintenance is a very fundamental thing. And finally, we've got the relationship of the animals with the nature, their natural world. Are they functioning as ecological animals that contribute to the natural world? All of these systems are either very fragile or almost broken. What I see is that regenerative, indeed agroecological systems, organic systems, offer better resilience all along uh, the animal components, but indeed further into the food chain. Thanks. Thanks, Lindsay. Janet, as a, as a 
<laughs> okay. As, uh, as an eminent academic. No, who's been please. Researching this um, for some time. I'll introduce myself. I feel very humbled coming to an event like this. I came for the first time last year, and I was both in hum humbled and inspired. Um, because uh, I don't come from a farming background. I grew up in, on the edge of a town. My parents were in education. Uh, but I was really keen on biology, so I did a biology degree. And then I got into agricultural economics. I won't explain how and why, but um, basically I began to think, you need to understand the economics and you need to understand the policy to know what's going wrong in agriculture, to try and understand what are the drivers that are leading to systems which are putting too much pressure on the planet. And that led me into work that's been on really working with policy and people for 30 years, looking at what can work, what should work, and how we could do things better. And, you know, you have a lot of frustrations, but you also have quite a few success stories along the way. Um, I went through a phase, kind of mid-career, of saying, actually, we'll forget the policy because it's just such a mess, and actually people need to innovate on the ground. And that's one of the great things about Groundswell, is you see a lot of people who said... F off to the policy, I'm just going to do it. Um, and that makes a real difference. And I think that we've now got to a stage with Regen and Alternative and Agroecology where, you know, the people on the ground with the knowledge are changing the policy, or at least that's my aspiration. Uh, but we've still got a long way to go to, to work out how to make that effective. We've got so used to, in policy circles, wanting to control everything, wanting to know exactly how you're going to do things before we'll release money or before we'll invest or before we'll give the, the support and the help that's needed, when actually these systems need the room to innovate and they need the flexibility to experiment and they need to be allowed to fail and to learn those lessons. And that's something that policymakers find very hard to deal with. But it's absolutely essential because, you know, we're in a, a time of crisis, we need to make enormous transitions in society to move away from fossil fuels. And we can only do that if we give people that space to be creative and to innovate and to fail and to learn lessons from failure. And so we can't have a policy machine that is risk averse, that is only giving you the money if you f tick all the boxes. And if you spend hours and hours working out how you can show that you're ticking the boxes because the evidence isn't immediately there. And a lot of these things are quite intangible, and I think that makes it very difficult for policymakers. So um, my message is really about trying to convince the people with the funds and the people making decisions at the top that they can learn a lot from not just listening to the people at the bottom, but enabling the people at the bottom to have more influence and more control over things. That means enabling joining up not working in silos. You know, it sounds like a cliche, but you see it over and over and over again. Even now with the new suite of agricultural transition policies, we have one policy for productivity, we have one policy for environment, we have one policy for animal welfare. And they need to work together because at the bottom, on the, on the farm, on your land, you're joining up all these things every day in the way you manage your businesses. And we need policies that enable that joining up. And, and Jenny will talk more about how when you go beyond the farm and you move into the local area, that joining up becomes even more important. And we're not very good at doing it, and policy often gets in the way of it happening rather than promoting it. And that's what we need to do better. So I'll probably sh shut up at that point. But <laughs> we, we will come back to those issues. Now to one of the great grassroots innovators, Jen. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, my name's Jenny Phelps. I work for the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group. And um, for nearly 30 years now, I've been trying to do what I think is the most important thing, is to build actual resilience on the ground to a climate emergency in the place where we need to really act, which is actually on the ground. And about 20 years ago, I developed an integrated framework, which we're actually launching today as an animation to help people to self-help, to take action on climate emergency, because I don't know, but I feel the urgency. I feel the need to act, and I feel the need to support people, to support themselves. And I think this is what we're finding as, uh, as practitioners, is this that, the, as has been said, the food system is broken. Our food vulnerability is intense. We have a, a very, very inequitable society. We're re leading on uh, feeding Gloucestershire in our case studies, and the number of people in food poverty is absolutely extraordinary. 
extraordinary. 2.9 million people had uh, emergency food parcels this year. And we think we can develop systems where we value local communities, join all the funders up at a local level, but that needs facilitation. It needs People need climate emergency helpers, facilitators, joiners, connected communities to their farmed environment, to their farmer groups, for food resilience, flooding, biodiversity, recovery, and all the wonderful things that we can do. And we even think we can crack food inequality by tracking ecosystem services from the landscape to all the delivering duties that are at a local authority level being devolved down from national government. So I think, I won't go into all the projects that we've done, but over 20, 30 years, we've had wonderful people like Janet research our case, our case studies, which are now international case studies about how to act, how to join things up, how to be efficient, how to mobilise, how to give people hope and look after the piece of the world that they care about. And I think that what we want to do is just to now scale that at a delivery level and to make sure that everybody has the chance to become resilient. So that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Janet, you are taking on the challenge of <laughs> creating the right policy conditions for farmers to innovate and change. Tell us about it. I am, not on my own, <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> with, a lot, with a lot of other people and obviously working for ministers who's, um, who's reformed this, this who, who own all of these reforms. So I, if you don't know me, I'm Janet Hughes. I'm the director of the Farming Reform Programme in DEFRA. Um, and I look after all the work we're doing to phase out the common agricultural policy in England and to bring in the reformed and improved environmental land management schemes and productivity and innovation support for farmers. And what we're trying to do with that is to support domestic food production and security and to support a thriving... Um, farm sector and profitable farm businesses and also to deliver very significant climate and environmental outcomes as well. And we need farmers to deliver all of those things because you're the ones who produce the food and who we rely on every day to do that. But you're also the ones who look after 70% of the countryside. And so if you want to see improvements in water quality, biodiversity, um, changes for um, climate change adaptation, etc., it's farmers that are going to have to deliver this. And we in, uh, we in government need to properly pay you to do that and properly support you to do that and enable you to do that. Exactly that word that's been used multiple times already by colleagues here. And what we're all about is trying to move away from getting in your way and tying your hands behind your back and instead get behind you and help you and enable you and give you the space and freedom to do all the amazing, innovative entrepreneurial creative things that you do to achieve those outcomes and when it comes to the science and research and evidence I think there's a few very important shifts that have taken place in our thinking in recent years one is we don't want to wait until something has had 15 years worth of solid empirical evidence before we let anybody go anywhere near it because that means we're way behind and we can't move fast enough so we're much more in the business of saying instead of saying here's a prescription based on things that have been proven over 20 years and now finally we're getting around to paying for them. Instead, here is what we'd like you to do. Have at it. Do it whatever you think the best way is for your farm as long as you achieve the thing that we're trying to get you to achieve, whether it's having well-established winter cover or having a companion crop that serves a particular purpose or whatever the particular action is. So it's all about um, flexibility, pragmatism and creating space for you to do those things in a way that works for your farm in your particular setting and allows you to innovate so we can move fast and make a difference. Um, we really want to enable you, to, rather than getting in your way, and we also have to recognise there isn't going to be an end point where we understand everything and now we can st set it all in stone. All we've done now, we've made everything marvellous and that's that done and we can all move on and do something else. Um, at some point in my life I might do that, uh, re you know, retire or have a rest or something, but <laughs> not for a while yet. Um, because we've got to, what we're trying to do is build a self-improving machine. So instead of having a programme now and then leave it all for 10 years and have another big programme and throw it all up in the air again in 10 years, which has been a bit of a cycle we've been stuck in, we were trying to create something that evolves over time. So as practice develops and evidence develops and um, communities develop, um, we can develop our schemes a lot to enable that and continue to improve and enable that instead of them getting stuck at a particular point in time. Um, having said that, there are some things that we do know work well on average, if people look after their hedgerows for winter to, to provide food and habitat over the winter, that's a good thing. If you look after your soil, it's a good thing. If you manage your nutrients and your pests in a more sustainable way, that's genu generally a good thing for the business, for food production, and also for the environment. And so in the schemes that we're running, the environmental land management schemes, that's what we're paying for. Those sorts of things which can help you have a profitable, resilient business and also deliver for the environment. Um, and if you haven't seen, 
We published some information in January about everything we're going to pay for in our environmental land management schemes. And we published some information last week about what the offer will be in the sustainable farming incentive this year. And it's a much more flexible, much broader offer that's available on a pick and mix basis for you to do what you want on your farm. So if you haven't yet clocked that, do take a look. And if you want to find out more about it, then find someone in one of these extremely fetching polo shirts. Uh, on the stand over there or wandering about and we'll be happy to help but really looking forward to the conversation today very excited to be here thank you for having me on the panel looking forward to the discussion thank you Janet now I've got loads of questions to ask my panel but I'm just going to pick up one that I know has been going through a lot of people's minds since the publication of last week's um, <coughs> offers the soil offers changed and that has a direct impact on lots of the folk here at this particular show who have been banking on being able to um, continue to develop those soil, uh, those soil practices. Just tell us your thinking about, um, about what happened there. Yeah, so what we've done in the, in the offer for... Uh, so we're rolling this scheme out incrementally. We've got a pilot underway. We've learned a huge amount from our pilot farmers about how the scheme needs to work so that it can work for farmers and be appropriately accessible and flexible and workable and have the desired results. We've also had lots of tests and trials in the field, and we've also had a first year of operating the Sustainable Farming Incentive. And we've learned a huge amount from that, and, and some of the most important things we've learned are about the need for flexibility. So we had standards, which were bundles of actions together, and you had to do everything in the standard. And we did that for good reasons, because doing those things in those combinations gets good outcomes, and also it makes it more straightforward, because you can just say, well, I'll do that standard, rather than having to navigate loads of options. The problem is, when we bundle things together in that way, and we say, you've got to do this on X percent of your land, and this on Y percent of your land, obviously every farm is different, and that particular combination might not work for you, and that particular percentage might not work for you, and it basically puts people off getting involved in the scheme, and that's not what we want. Uh, we want you to be able to flex and use the, use the range of options, and we want, you to, we want to respect the fact that you are actually the people who know your farm much better than we do, and are going to know what's the right proportion to do in any given year and the right combinations to do. So all of the new things that we're introducing into the Sustainable Farming Incentive this year are available on a pick-and-mix basis. So each action individually, you decide how much or how little of it you want to do, where you want to do it, um, and a lot of them you can rotate each year and you can vary the coverage each year. What we thought we would do with the 2022 offer is continue running it alongside that because we don't want to muck around with people who have already come into the scheme. We don't want to say one thing and then do another. But as we developed it, we realized that doing that was not the right thing to do because the right thing to do is de to unbundle things and offer them pick as pick and mix. We've already decided that, so why would we keep these things in a bundle and those things not? It's very confusing having the two offers together. And also, if you're in the soil standards, it would have restricted your access to the new wider range of actions in 2023. So we decided we were going to disaggregate them and offer all the actions in the soil standards on a pick and mix basis as well. When we did that, we realized there were some things that we were paying for we could take forward. So multi-species cover, for example, herbal lays. If you're doing those now, you can continue doing them. But some actions that we were paying for in the current offer only really make sense if they're done in combination and at a certain percentage level. Otherwise, we just can't justify paying for them. So we can't justify paying for adding organic matter because we'll simply be paying farmers to do what you're already doing. There's no change arising from that at all. We cannot justify spending that money in that way. And so there are some things which we're not going to offer on a pick-and-mix basis. If you are already in an agreement, you will have had a letter explaining what will happen to you and how we will make sure that you will not lose out as a result of this change, financially or otherwise. So please don't worry. If you've got an SFI agreement now, you will have a letter in your inbox, and it will explain to you how, if you've made a commitment to do these things for three years, we will pay you for it. We're not going to let you down. We're not going to muck you about. We will make the process seamless for you. What we're trying to do is give you access to a much wider range of options on a more flexible basis. So it should be a win for you in terms of what you can access, and you definitely will not lose out. And if you haven't read the email, because you don't always read them, please do read that one, because it explains to you how we're going to make sure that you don't lose out as a result of moving from one to the other. And we decided we did make quite a conscious decision to just be very upfront about this. We are testing and learning. We've done a pilot. We're, in, we're going into the third year of the pilot. We've had a first year of rollout. We have learned a lot. And we need to be upfront about that fact and say, right, there are some things that we've done that are really good, and we're going to take them forward. And there are some things that we have done that have not worked as we, we would like them to do, and we're not going to take them forward. And just be very upfront up and make a clean break so that we can put a better offer in place. We are not planning to do this every year. This is, a, this is a big change, which is a product of where we are now in this cycle of rolling things out, 
what we're now expecting to do is roll out the Sustainable Farming Centre this year and then just be adding more things into it from now on. So we're not expecting this level of upheaval again. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Jana. And that's a really lovely vignette, I think, about how we create the conditions for change to happen. And everybody on the panel has picked up that theme in one way or another. What are the bigger conditions, the macro conditions, if you like, that encourage farmers and indeed other associated businesses start to shift their practices? What kind of support do farmers themselves, farmers and growers need on the land to make, in some cases, these quite dramatic changes? Russ, coming back to you, what, what have you learned from all of the work that you've been doing in the last hundreds of years? <laughs> You're definitely the youngest on the I panel. Was I was, was going to call us the grumpy old women panel, but you know, grumpy old women plus Russ. <laughs> Honorary grumpy old woman for for, t for today. Thanks so what, much. What, what, have you, what, what have you been learning from what, from from what actually works? What helps and supports farmers to trust the situation enough to start making what is for some of them quite big changes to the way they go about their work? Well, I think there's some, there's some quite good theory around how change happens, and you get early adopters, and then you get the followers of the early adopters that then start to make new ideas or new practices mainstream. And I think there's a lot to be said by um, uh, enabling and supporting those early adopters to really explore ideas. And that means having the space and the confidence to do that and not be too tidy knots where we can't experiment on our farms and put down a section of a field to a different crop to see how it goes or to try something different with livestock. And so I think it's really important to, to have, have that space and that support um, and that can come in lots of different forms. And I think that the power of facilitation of farmer learning is really good. Farmer learning together rather than individuals trying to d struggle to do something on their own. Um, and ultimately building confidence for, for people to try and explore things. Any of you that were at the pasture poultry session this morning, some really pioneering farmers trying to produce poultry without using soya to um, meet, meet with all the regulations and trying to really innovate to do that. They're they're really pushing at the boundaries, and thank God they are, because others can then learn from them and, and, and go further. But I think we've, we've, we've ended up in a situation where, as farmers, we're often competing with one another, and we're not really collaborating. I saw that. It was really interesting in Romania, the 48 farmers working together collectively in a village, and they hire just one stockman to manage all of their herd together in the daytime. So th they've, got a, they've got more of a culture of collaboration and, and, and we've certainly lost that here and there's a lot to be you know it's coming back definitely but there's a lot to be said for that and how we can support farmers on a journey of change and a continuous journey of change and continuous learning and evolving what we do brilliant thanks Russ I'm going to come to you next Jen because you've been doing this grassroots work for for forever <laughs> and and have enormous experience in working alongside farmers in their communities to join up all of the different yeah. incentives and opportunities and possibilities for change that's not just on farm change, but change for whole ecosystems yeah. and indeed you know, thriving local food systems. So what have you found about what's needed to facilitate that system change, not just on farm change? Well, from my perspective, and I've been going on about this for nearly two decades now, and been, I think I'm on my seventh Secretary of State about trying to show the importance of local delivery. And I'm glad to be friends with Janet because I'm really hopeful that the realisation that the only thing that can really join it up at a local level to your locality, to the place that you care about, that's important to your sorry, important to your community and to your culture, is a person who can help facilitate that join up in the piece of the world that you care about within a global context. And actually, at the moment, as practitioners and many of my team are here, that there's an absolute maze of funding streams out there from multiple different sources, not just from Janet's departments, but a lot of the duties around social, uh, economic, and environmental environmental delivery in a climate emergency is devolving down to our local authorities and actually a lot of those people have got multiple different funding streams. In Gloucestershire we've got £500 million of budget around social, economic and environmental duties. We need to create projects that enable our local authorities to deliver across that from the land and most importantly
importantly, leave no one behind. You know, there are so many people in food poverty. Let's create community growing areas. Let's have people, farmer groups working together to help communities with flooding. You know, let's get people out there learning how to cook and manage their soil. Let's integrate the funding from the flooding and coastal committees into soil and to all the other different ways that we can do that. And the only way that you can do that is to have people who are trained in how to facilitate what you can join up at a local level while valuing the people and the culture of the people that are there. And we've been doing that for 20 years. And the funding streams that are coming out under, for example, the Farm Resilience Programme is brilliant, but it's not training people to a common vision of climate resilience, climate emergency, food equity, and actually making us all being able to respond to climate emergency together. So I would really wish that there was uh, a real investment in, in training people to be helping themselves. Find a facilitator within your community or within an organization that you love and trust and actually join it up because there's huge amounts of resource, huge amounts of social capital, people wanting to act on climate emergency and an enormous amount of funding from multiple different local, national and international levels that could facilitate rapid investment in climate response. So that's what we need. Thank you. I mean, that's, that's brilliant. As a, as a farmer myself, that is what I want. I want somebody to come and hold my hand and take me through all of the opportunities that matter to me in my place, in my context, as part of my community, with all of the opportunities and challenges that, uh, that might arise. Now, I'm going to change the tempo a little bit. Um, Lindsay, and you too, Janet, um, you've, you've been working in some quite contested space. Where, when we're talking about where is the evidence settled and where is it not settled? Where are the challenges coming from? The role of livestock in sustainable agroecological food systems is incredibly contested space at the moment. Where are the opportunities, do you think, to channel arguments in a way that work for, for farmers, for communities, for the environment, for the climate? Yeah, um, well, from my point of view, it shouldn't be contested. I mean, uh, let's step, take a step back. Um, it, they're contested because we reduce them to their emissions, mm. which is really tragic. So let's think about emissions. Um, and I've done some back of the envelope um, calculations here. So if we've got one cow emitting 0.6 of a litre of methane every day, and we've got roughly one billion cows on the planet, that's around 600 million litres of methane produced every day. If we look at humans, because we're also emitting gas, uh, roughly around a litre a day of which one uh, tenth of that is methane. But there are 7.8 billion humans on the planet, which makes 780 million litres per day. So there's a bit of perspective. It's not all about the cows. It may be about cow numbers, but it's not about the cow. Emissions are part of a healthy gut. That's a fact. So let's think of that. How do we keep the right number of animals and keep them healthy? And how do we understand the recycling of these nutrients? So the carbon recycling. How do we capture these nutrients and make them a meaningful component of our food systems? When we consider that we've got 61 million hectares of permanent pasture in the UK alone, and livestock are critical, or grazing animals are critical to the good biodiversity of these systems, then actually keeping livestock becomes a no-brainer. What we have to do is understand how to do it better. Thank you. We, we talk about contested arguments, and you quite rightly pushed back. And Jen earlier said this is a broken food system. But I often say, if we think you know, systems are rarely broken, but if we think a system is broken, we're not looking to where the real beneficiaries lie. And you've been doing this kind of work, the power and the politics of food systems, working at a policy level as well as with farmers at and communities all around the country. Yeah. Why do you think these arguments get contested? Where are the current benef beneficiaries? And how do we start challenging this notion that it's broken to it's currently benefiting? 
I certain people and it needs to benefit others. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 you could talk all day about this and still not get a, a clear answer. I think there's something about people looking with very, own, very narrow perspectives with one particular interest that drives them. And you get this in all these debates about climate and emissions. You know, where does the climate change problem arise from? It arises from our dependence on fossil fuels and our use of a non-renewable resource. And if we want to solve it, then fundamentally that's the challenge we have to address. And a lot of all this stuff about emissions and livestock is about trying to do things that will avoid us having to tackle that real significant shift. Yeah. And I was thinking when, when Janet was talking, you know, it can be very easy to get narrowly focused on how do we fund the land management in a kind of very mechanistic way when actually everyone who owns land and is managing it for food production <coughs> is also managing it for a whole load of other things and is also managing a house, a family, or whatever else it might be. And there's multiple other connections. So, you know, we might have a brilliant scheme for land management, but we might have a rubbish scheme for getting you off fossil fuels in your heating system. You know, the policy at the moment towards rural decarbonisation is that everybody's got to have electric he heat source pumps. And actually, given the buildings you've got, given the situations you're in, given the underused resources that you've got in rural areas, like a lot of woodland that's not managed, you know, a, a, an electric heat pump is not necessarily your way forward. And we've got these siloed policies that support a model which works in a big city situation, which may not be the model that's actually appropriate in a rural situation. And this is what you find over and over again with people who've been innovative at the local level. It's because they've made these <coughs> connections. What are my assets? What are my opportunities? What are my underused resources? Who can I reach out to in my local area who's got a need that I could meet and reciprocate. And it is where you get that joining up, you know, beyond these little issues that you can see actually there might be completely different and much simpler and cheaper and more effective ways to do things than to see it all as about these big, you know, we've got to all put all our animals indoors so that we can capture their methane and then feed it into big industrial systems. You know, it, it, it's, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so thinking in systems, thinking you're just in systems, demonstrating what but, it but looks like. But not making that sound like it's really intellectual and, and high, you know, highbrow. It's it's about local people identifying where I've got something I could do for you and how how we could do things in a different way, and not thinking this is only niche and will never make a difference because actually any difference you make is important and you're demonstrating every day by example as well to other people who can then see well I could do it differently myself. Go on there, and then I'm going to open up. Yeah, so I just wanted to add something as well, that um, for livestock, we've reduced their diets to um, production-focused foodstuffs. We know they're high-producing methane. We can actually reduce methane emissions by giving them a more varied diet, one that includes trees and forbs that contain, contain condensed tannins. So there has been some research done on... Um, methane emissions when you feed animals willow and we can see uh, between 30 and 50 percent reduction in methane emissions when they have willow in their diet compared to ryegrass um, and alfalfa so we can do something about emissions but naturally <laughs> oh all right then oh, but thanks. We, we, <laughs> I know I'm so sorry and I'm sure Stress. Janet would like to come back on some of the things that's been said as well I just wanted to say that you know one of the things that I really think in the room I'm sure loads of you are involved in community projects and are doing all this sort of stuff yourself as well and that one of the things that I really think we ought to look at is community energy from human sewage let's get the sewage out of our rivers and let's produce biomethane and just to say that we've just converted our house from oil to bio uh, to green biogas it costs two and a half thousand pounds pounds so you know we need to get the whole society off oil and that we can do that in a way that generates real healthy economy at the same time but I just wanted to say that thank you Sue I'm glad you did say that so I'll talk to you about that later um, <laughs> no you can't <laughs> quiet um, I'm, I'm going to come to the audience now who may well have questions if you don't I'm just going to come back to the panel so indicate to me if you have some questions <coughs> Um, me, well, while you think about it, go on, Lindsay. Thank you. Roll it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to say, uh, if we capture human waste uh, and capture the methane off it, if, if we then use some of that energy to burn that waste, we've got a good source of potash. We are currently using finite resources of potash. 
we have an infinite resource there. Brilliant. So as we wait for um, the mics to move around the room, just quickly, Janet, everybody's talked about policy across systems. That's an age-old problem within government. Are you seeing any hope that government's starting to think more in a joined-up way and acting in a joined-up way? I think this is, this is really... This is one of the most difficult things about government is joining up different types of... different bits of... different considerations and different policies and coming up with something coherent. So a really good example of that is land use, where there are lots of competing demands for land, for homes, for energy, for food, for environmental goods, and how do you make sure that you're optimising your land use to achieve all of those, given you're probably not going to get all of what you want on any of them, and how do you do that nationally? How do you set a framework for that nationally and how, that allows the right space for things to be done locally in a way that is sensitive to the local situation is a massive conundrum, and that's one of the things that some of my colleagues are working on. I think the benefit of the programme that I'm working on is that we are tr we're trying to be an integrator of at least some of these policies. So we're looking at productivity, we're looking at regulation, we're trying to achieve multiple outcomes across farm productivity, food production and environment. We're not just here to deliver one of those slices, we're here to integrate across a range of different things and produce a set of interventions that serve all those purposes. And we work with lots of policy teams across DEFRA to do that. And that in itself is quite a complicated undertaking. Are we also really, really good at linking up with our, policy, our co colleagues working on local energy or broadband or whatever else? Nowhere near good enough, I would say. It, it's very, very difficult to do and, ve and, and clearly a thing that it would be great if it could happen. But I think what Jenny says is right, is that that's in some ways the, m the right place for that to happen is locally because it's in, in each area, the priorities will be different, the circumstances will be different, the preferences of the local community will be different. And so actually... You want those balances and trade-offs to be made in that area, and that's why this, the work we're trying to do on um, the, the facilitation fund and supporting this sort of convening and facilitating role is so critical because where we see that happening, it really does catalyse things happening that are brilliant instead of just good. Um, farmers joining up with each other, communities joining together, and that, that's what we really want to see happening. So we, we don't want to do a top-down, join everything up from the top. It just can never happen. It's got to be, it's got to be locally driven, really. Thanks. Thanks, Janet. Well, actually, Janet, that was the, the perfect segue because I, I wanted to ask um, some of our on-the-ground innovators uh, what they thought about the emerging land use framework. Um, I, I think it's very sort of easy, but we can all innovate on the ground and do what's best for us. Uh, and it's sometimes not clear whether that's actually best for the country or in the interest of society. So uh, I wanted to hear how, how you approach that uh, you know, when you are making these, these entrepreneurial strides. Thank you for that question. For those of you that don't know, FFCC, my organisation, has been piloting locally led land use frameworks for the last few years. And in fact, we've got, we'll, we'll have a, uh, a paper coming out on that in August to kind of pull together all of the learning and insight from that. But I think, it, you know, spoiler alert, it's going to affirm a great deal of what we're hearing from everybody that uh, things need to be mediated at a local level in relation to particular context and conditions. But Janet. I think there's also, I mean, there's an ability to make use now of, of um, social media and the ability to learn online. Because what you need to be able to do at the local level is not just what works for your local area, but to see how it's going to contribute to the bigger picture, to know that what you're doing when it all adds up is going to make that difference at the higher level. And um, it's been difficult to do that in the past, but I think it's more possible now. Y you almost need to learn from what goes on with benchmarking in agricultural sectors you know people feed their data into a system and then that data is sort of mashed together and you get to see what you know how you benchmark against other people and you can see how your performance is and it would be very easy we have a lot of data nationally and internationally on you know important habitats and hot spots for climate and all these kind of things and if that data could be made more easy for people to access and to understand and, and there's a lot of people working on that now then you can actually ensure that you work at the local level, but you can see that it's appropriate at the national level. I can remember a long time ago, I did a piece of work on the wildlife trusts and how they operated. This was back in the early 1990s. And th the problem was that each one of them wanted a bit of everything. You know, they wanted in their county, they wanted a bit of wetland, a bit of heathland, a bit of, you know, nice rich pasture and everything. Whereas if you looked at it from the national level, actually it was much more important for the people on Dartmoor to be looking at, you know, or shrub heath or whatever it was and much more important for people in East Anglia to be thinking about re-wetting you know sort of marshland areas if you wanted 
a nice balance at the national level. So it's, it's about that. It's about, I think we have the tools now to make that kind of uh, bottom-up planning possible. <laughs> Data is really, really important, and that certainly chimes with the work that we've done in partnership with the Geospatial Commission, um, a, a government department who's been looking at data. Data is critical, but then we have to ask the question, whose data really counts? When there's, when there's competition for data, how do we facilitate the, um, the, the complicated conversations that arise as a result? Jen, and then, uh, did I see a person with a hand up? Can I just answer, answer that really quickly also? It's just that um, some of the stuff that's really super exciting to me, and uh, if you don't know about our framework, um, it's about uh, taking local action but in the context of the biosphere, the global biosphere. And it's really exciting because actually you can take local action and have a global impact. And it's, it's, it's super exciting, really, because actually what we can do <coughs> is we can take what you've done, we can create an environmental baseline for your community, and we can map that for the ecosystem services. But through working with Ordnance Survey and other geospatial um, bodies, we can actually plug that into the United Nations Aries for SEA, the Global Biosphere Ecosystem Service Assessment. So you can actually see, as a community, as a group, as a county, how you're impacting your, what you're doing locally, but within that wider context. And that will incorporate all the United Nations Nation Sustainable Development Goals. So there is a system working locally where it's okay for you to have hope and look after your local area, but realise you're plugging in to that global ambition to sort of climate emergency. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Jen. Person with beard. Yes, Helen, thank you. <laughs> um, I think my, my question is around um, the scale and pace of change that is needed at this time. And I suppose I reflect on, and I know it's not all about emissions, uh, but I do reflect on the, the sort of main lockdown COVID year, global emissions reduced by about 5%. What we actually need is somewhere in the order of 15% globally, not just one year, but year after year after year until we reach real zero, not net zero. Um, and actually in a country like ours, if we include the aspect of equity, our reduction should be even faster. So. I suppose my question is, you know, we had this sort of discombobulation feeling in our society with the COVID changes and policies that were introduced for that crisis. And I'd be really interested to hear what kind of policies, even if they would feel uncomfortable and discombobulating, that you think of, that you dream of, that maybe you don't feel comfortable sharing ordinarily, but I invite you to share with us today, which is actually commensurate with the challenge that we face. Thank you. That's a great, great question. Russ, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, and I think um, what we're seeing is that actually to make those kind of reductions that we need, um, it's possible. Um, it's possible to graze our livestock without fossil fuels, to just have them f um, following a, a natural system of grazing aided by electric fencing systems that are solar powered and that all of the, the kind of physical work that is done by the farmer can be done on foot by hand. Yes, it's hard work, but it keeps us fit, so it perhaps it has multiple purposes there. Uh, and, and then it's simply a case of how we get those animals to slaughter or, or get the milk to rev to the customers. And so we can see that, that that's possible to kind of meet those kind of targets. But what's not happening is is, is having the mindsets and the, and the framework to be able to necessarily deliver that very easily when there's support for sending us perhaps the other way. I spoke about these farmers in Romania trying to do lots of grazing, but they're getting government funding to put in robots and keep all their animals indoors and, and ship them maize. And so that's not a UK context, but it's, in, it's also happening in the UK where we've got um, financial support for systems that are sending us in, in the wrong direction. So I think we need to have a more serious rethink about uh, you know, where we need to get to. And I think we're often teetering around the edges and not actually saying we need to be knocking this back 15% per year as you said and, and more to really make mass transition but there's a whole it's highly complex and we need to we haven't even got into diet and, and that needs to change as well so that we can um, that, that, that dietary shift can support farmers shifting what they do as well Lindsay policies commensurate with the scale of the challenge <coughs> uh, I, Janet? yeah 
Right, okay. Um, I'm going to move into a different area of policy, uh, which I know about, and see if the, any of this kind of works. So uh, I lecture on environmental policy making to master's students, and I always give them the example of the end-of-life vehicle directive as a really good way to try and get change overnight, dramatic change in a sector. And that's because in the motor man manufacturing industry, there are very few, very large players who control the system, basically. And actually, it's not so much different in the food system. And what did they do? The Commission, the European G Commission, got in the room with the big motor manufacturers and said, look, time's up, mate. You've got to start thinking about the waste that you're generating, and you've got to start bearing the costs of the waste that you're generating in your systems. And they, they brought in a directive with the say-so of those people, because they were all in a room together and they had to come to some agreement. And it just continually frustrates me in the food sector that government will not work that way with the people who have the power and influence. And I don't fully understand why that doesn't happen. But, you know, when, when there were issues in COVID, you know, the, there could have been a lot of really constructive, behind closed doors, small group talking with the people in the power. The people with the power in the food industry are the major multiples, aren't they? They're not the individuals. And they've got a huge amount of influence. And they sit there and they say, we're serving, we're giving the c consumer what they want. You know, it's, there's a huge responsibility on those people's shoulders. Um, and that might be a bit controversial, but we're not going to get change until they really believe it and they really want to make a change. I'm sneaking chairs privilege in and building on that because I don't care if it's controversial or not. <laughs> My policy offer would be, let's just ban Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola. Let's ban, <laughs> let's not make the crap stuff. Yeah. And if, let's not leave it to citizens. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Because we're really, really good at talking about innovation and creativity. We are really bad in governments, in business, but perhaps even as a society, to talk about what needs to end. We're really bad at helping to hospice and end the stuff that has to end. So that's where I'd be facing into. I'm going to go Janet, then Jen. What would your radical policy be? You, <laughs> let's pretend nobody, nobody's listening. Fund facilitators. Nobody can Fund hear facilitators. you. Fund facilitators. Nobody can hear you. Nobody's listening. The policy commensurate with the scale of the challenge ahead. I Pick think, a different sector. I think the good news for everyone is that that's not what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, I don't run for election, I'm not a politician, it's not my job to make up new policies, but I will say that the policy I'm responsible for designing and implementing of phasing out farm subsidies is actually pretty radical. It's the biggest change for 70 years. What we've got to do is make sure we actually deliver that in a way that delivers the sort of scale of change that you're talking about. But on its own, obviously, it's not going to be sufficient. There's all sorts of other conditions required. Um, but I hate to be a civil servant. I'm not going to start making policy up on the stage, I'm afraid. <laughs> I Even <will>. at Groundswell. <laughs> I'd be happy to comment. <laughs> but I, I actually think that it's really interesting because the projects that we're doing actually funded by DEFRA. And, and the tragedy I keep saying to Janet is DEFRA doesn't realise what it's funding. It's so innovative. Yes, and we so, do. We love so it. I know, but you know, you know, implement. <laughs> but anyhow, just to say that what... <laughs> what so, so just to say is that what's really 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 interesting is this the fact that we are creating with the support of the sustainable food trust and other friends um, an opportunity to map what the ecosystem services coming from the land and um, map that directly to the opportunities for global investment obviously there's that local investment local authority mapping as well we're trying to do a, a mapping procurement but that international investment is really really exciting and transformational change could happen tomorrow the Green Finance Institute and various others are wanting projects of a minimum of £100 million. What we need to do is to create multiple projects of £100 million with the integrity around land use. So we know how to map the land for ecosystem services. We know how to do a sustainability tag, tag to the land that can link to these global uh, requirements for ESGs. And so if we did that, we can then invest rapidly in community energy, in hempcrete plants, in local abattoirs, in wool processing, in wood processing, in investing in the, in the machinery and equipment and livestock and training that people need to be able to be resilient to climate change. And that is real, and that is what we're going to do. Right, one more, one more question. Well done. Do we have a question there at the back? Oh, Xanthi, let's grab you down at the front then. Hi. Um, Janet, you mentioned earlier that, um, that DEFRA couldn't justify paying farmers for doing things that they're doing anyway, um, where there's no change arising from it at all. Um, and I just wondered, what concerns me, I'm not a farmer, but it does concern me that farmers 
um, who that there's no incentive for farmers to uh, to to keep going without. Sorry, I'm not phrasing myself very well. Start again. How can the system reward farmers who've been farming well for years? Because I'm concerned that in a that there's an incentive to start deliberately start from a low base in order to pick up the most financial incentives. Brilliant. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you've asked that question. Thank you. It's, that is a really, really important question, and it's very much at the heart of what we're doing. So let me try and explain myself. So what we're paying for in the environmental land management schemes is actions which, are, which can have an environmental impact, either on water quality, air quality, biodiversity, or whatever. When we're paying for those actions... They, they will often be also beneficial for the farm business and for farm profitability, as I mentioned earlier, and for food production. When we're deciding what should government pay for, we're looking for actions that achieve multiple outcomes and that are beneficial on average and that are going to be workable for farmers and that we can operationally actually look after and that are good value for money. And so if it's the case that there's an action that's a good thing for farming, a good thing for the environment, but 90% of farmers do it already, then we don't need to pay for it because... It's already happening. It's an accepted part of doing business. If it's something that, say, 10% of farmers do already and we really like to see 50% doing it, then we're quite happy to pay for it and we don't mind paying for those who are already doing it to maintain that action and paying for everybody else to start it because on balance we, we, we're delivering a change there. And there's always a judgment call to be made about that where we've got to demonstrate that what we're doing is delivering value. It's important to say that there is huge value in maintaining practices that you've already established and habitats that you've already established. Um, and, and we do pay for that. We pay for a lot of that already. Um, and we're going to be paying for more of it. And so it's not just about additionality in what we're doing. It is about maintenance as well. But when it comes to the 2022 soil standards, there are the, the particular actions that I was talking about are adding organic matter to your soil without any requirement to do it at a particular scale or level or in combination with other actions, would that, that is something that farmers will be doing typically anyway. And we can't justify just only paying for that action, which is something that you would normally do in the course of your farming. It's not ambitious enough. It's not bringing about change in the sector. That's what I was getting at. But, but there is always a judgment call there. We will pay for maintenance. We absolutely do, we do that already. We've got to make sure that that's a viable proposition so you don't just get loads of money to create something and not enough to maintain it. And um, We absolutely have got to pay those who have been doing this for ages um, at a, as a correct and reasonable level, and that's what we're doing in schemes. And that's actually why the payments are based on actions and not additional results, partly for that reason, partly because the results will vary depending on where you are and what the weather was like and uh, other freak stuff that happens. So I hope that's, I hope that's settled the concern. I didn't mean... We won't pay you if you're already doing something. That's absolutely not what I meant at all. I think I mean, we no doubt will follow this up um, in all sorts of other settings as well. But I think there is a real issue, and I see it around me, where farmers are some farmers are more motivated by market signals at the moment after the Ukraine crisis, and I'm seeing old established pasture being ploughed up now in order to be able to plant it up for the food security crisis. Now the, the clear signals from government, the clear policy signals need to counteract yep. this so-called market signal that's pulling us in the opposite direction. Anyway, to be yep. discussed. Yep. Um, good. Um, by way of wrapping up, I'm going to come back. So rapid run down my panel. We haven't, we haven't, so rapid run down my panel. Otherwise, I'm going to get, um, we're going to get thrown off the stage <laughs> with only a minute to go. We talked about where we think the evidence and the research is relatively well established. Where are, do you think, the really important next questions that we need to be focusing our attention on next? Where are the next questions, the next challenges that we need to be leaning into and doing the work for so we can really carry on building this critical mass for change that we have here? Starting with you, Russ, and running down the panel. I think building on the, the, the psychology and mindset that I mentioned earlier, it's, I'm seeing a lot of um, new entrant, younger farmers coming in being really crucial to driving a lot of change in businesses, and I, but I think it's it's hard for them. And how? What can we do to make uh, farming a more attractive industry sector for culture for younger people to come in with new ideas and the ambition and motivation to make these changes happen? That's Ross Lindsay. For me, I think it's understanding the real carrying capacity of our landscape to know how many livestock we should have in our systems. Uh, and alongside this, compassion. Compassion for the humans, 
for the animals and for the landscape. So we understand how we're benefiting each of them rather than degrading that system. Um, okay, I, I think um, if we need to think about getting off fossil fuels, if you look at all the ways in which current society depends on fossil fuels for things, and when we need to replace them, we'll be looking back to um, some of our natural resources to help provide some of those things. So I think there's a huge number of new potential markets that need um, a bit of help and a bit of people getting together and working together in networks to try and develop them. And you'll see examples, obviously, in, in the showground here um, over the next couple of days, but I think it goes really far. You know, you think about your life, your daily life, all the things that you use and the things that might at the moment have plastic in them, might have oil derivatives in them, petrochemicals, pharmaceuticals, all kinds of stuff. Um, there's a lot of scope for added value, unconventional production in those areas. Um, and it's, it's joining up the people who are interested in doing that, I, I think will be a really interesting area for future development. And the, op the, the great thing about it is, is some of these can have very high returns. I mean, if you think of pharmaceuticals, certain types of plant, you know, you only need a tiny area of land in that plant to produce something that's hugely valuable. Um, and it also offers the opportunity to bring more people into the management of land. Because one of the things that really upsets me is, that, is the dwindling number of people who actually have a functional connection with land management anymore. And it's one of our biggest societal crises going forward, it seems to me. So if we can find ways to bring people back into um, farming and other kinds of um, sustainable land management, you know, that's going to be better for us for the future. Thank you. Janet, I'm going to come to you next. I'm going to let you have big finish. <laughs> um, I don't think there's one single thing. I think the big challenge is that w I think it's reasonable to assume we will continue to see huge uncertainty, volatility and complexity all around us. And hoping that, that at some point that's all going to settle down and become stable again is probably hoping in vain. And the big challenge there is how do you create the conditions for the sort of innovation we're talking about and the sort of evolution of policy and delivery that we're talking about so that you can both have food you can have food production and profitable farm businesses and environmental outcomes in such a context like that and that that's a big big enough challenge for me to be going on with for now i think and for us all to be getting along with really thanks jenny, jenny. Oh, well, thank you um yeah just to say for me i i'm not going to do anything more in the future because i've spent 20 years with the support of people like janet proving that an integrated framework works. And I've done tests and trials, I've done, and I have to do it again for DEFRA. So I, we don't, I'm not gonna do it anymore. I'm just gonna go out there and deliver it. And I'm gonna get an army of young people who want to save the piece of the world they care about. And I'm going to enable them to have hope and actually join up and be part of really brilliant, resilient communities that value their food, value the people in society, an equitable society. And I'm just gonna say, please look at what we've done already because the evidence is there. We need facilitators. We need 3,000 climate emergency facilitators to link to green neighborhood planning, to deliver our local plans that declare climate emergency, to help our climate leadership groups at a county council who are trying to aggregate social and economic and environmental resilience in a climate emergency. And we just need to get on with it. So that's what I'm gonna do. So Brilliant. thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Answering, uh, asking and answering the question. Thank you my panel. Thank you, um, audience, for listening.